Oh, maybe I should go in. Sorry. Okay. I'm Madeline Brockelman. I'm Jennifer Brockelman. I'm Caitlin Faulkner. I'm Emma Casanova. I'm Sam Meeker. And what we have is a thing called this poll thing. And what it is, is you basically, you can text things and it will show up on the screen. Like we did an example right here of I think of diamonds used in the jewelry industry. And the question we have for you is, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about diamonds? To text in your answer, you will type 695268 then your message and send it to 37607. If you have any problems, we would gladly assist you. <laughs> yes. <coughs> Send your answers, they will appear on the screen. Okay, I'm not trying to be stupid. So, in my two line, I do the 695 whatever. Correct? And the address bar you do 37607. The text will be sent to 37607. And what's 6952? You have to put in your message, message, and then you have to put the answer to the question. I understand. Okay. Try again. I don't okay. I messed up on this yesterday. So. The top one? That's the longer one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then in the space? Oh, no, no, no. That goes in the space. Like right here. The 637607 three, six, seven, oh, okay. goes in the, where, the, like, the number to where you are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that you? Seriously, I need mean, help. No. Did you guys plan for this to take 10 minutes? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then in the space and type in your answer. Okay. Wilma. My husband. Did you use that one? My husband. <laughs> so has everybody sent their answers in? Almost. <laughs> Mr. Smith, do you want help? Two and a half months <laughs> out. <laughs> or whatever they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know who's, who Wilma is. Diamonds have helped show 
the, the story of increasing complexity throughout the time that we have come to existence. And starting with the Big Bang, everything came from the Big Bang. Without the Big Bang, nothing would be here today. And this picture right here is kind of like my image of what I think about when I think of the Big Bang, like a, cert, a sudden like, burst, because that's, that's what it was. It happened like that. And Big Bang created matter, like matter, that helped form into stars. And then as I mentioned earlier, stars, ha stars have a supernova explosion which create chemical elements. The chemical elements and matter eventually combine to help form our solar system. And within the formation of our solar system and Earth, diamonds actually began to have all their great properties that they need in order to form in the mantle. While this was going on and Earth finally formed, eventually life began to form. And as life began to form, it began to evolve. And while all this was going on, plate tectonics was going on. About four times the plates have gone apart then come back together. When they're together, it's called Pangea. And this picture right here is about how plate tectonics and volcanoes have impacted the discovery of diamonds. So right here is a Kimberlite pipe, which means that there's the volcano and it goes down to where the diamonds are forming at. So when it explodes, the diamonds come up and there's the crust and the mantle and all that. So that is how we have began to find diamonds and that's why they are there today. Okay. So since the discovery of diamonds, well, a new thing was formed, so everybody wants this new thing. So collective learning was put into place because how else are they going to figure out how to get these diamonds? So going on today, the demands of diamonds have been increasing completely until, until today. And since the, the demands of diamonds are increasing, not every area has, the, has diamonds. So there are people who export diamonds, which is typically the people in the east, so the countries, and the people in the west are the ones needing the diamonds for all of these different uses that are coming out as people are trying to conserve energy, because that's the big thing that's going on right now. And so that is basically the main reason, and all these different uses have led to impacts on these countries that have been exporting these diamonds. So you think that since they have, they are, all these diamonds are being exported out, they think you would have a very good economy. Well, the diamonds have actually created wars. And these diamonds are given the nickname blood diamonds. So this picture is a diamond that's dripping blood. This is to symbolize all the wars that have gone on because of this, the harsh, harsh treatment of people who mine the diamonds, and also, since there's all these different governments going around and wanting to get the diamonds, people are having very bad trust issues that's going on. And that's causing separating economies. And then diamonds in chemistry. A lot of people know that diamonds are the hardest substance to help plant. So that would make it easy that tools could be formed to help with things that are going on in chemistry. And obviously, diamonds are mostly made up of carbon. And chemistry has been along with advancing complexity. And so scientists are, have been trying to make new diamonds for the time when they come out, because once they're gone, we can't get them back. But they've also created fake diamonds. And this picture is, which is real and how can you tell? In these two pictures, you really can't tell the difference that's going on in these. So that shows how even a little kid who's making their First communion, and they want a little, they want a ring with a diamond in it. Well, they can have a diamond ring, and they don't have to, mothers don't have to go through the worry, oh, are, are they going to lose it? How much is it going to cost? They can have a cheap little, like, $20 ring, and it, it'll look nice. Diamonds have been used medically um, for a number of years in the history of the world. Um, it started in the Dark Ages, and they, back then, it was not as complex. And they were used, they were swallowed, they would just eat the diamonds, and they believed that it healed 
any scars they had or illnesses they suffered from, but in reality it didn't. St. Hildegard also wrote that back in the Dark Ages, they would hold the diamond in one hand while making the sign of the cross, and it would heal all ailments and stuff. But during the Middle Ages, that was proven unsuccessful. Um, but now, into the 20th and 21st centuries, we have found real treatments that use diamonds. The treatments are mainly for cancers and tumors. Um, the diamond studded patch is uh, what that picture shows. It is a patch studded with uh, diamond particles and when a tumor is removed, they put it inside you and then that helps keep the tumor from coming back and it has been proven very successful and is used many times now. It, um, diamonds are also used to um, find magnetic fields. And as that gets enhanced, we will be able to detect the gene protein structures that are spinning the wrong way, which tells where the cancer is. And diamonds will soon be used to um, fix that once we find it. Uh, X-ray lasers are used in both medical and scientific uses because now that there's a diamond membrane, it is non-toxic, even though the membranes before have been toxic, so they were not good for medical uses. But now, they're used in both scientific and medical uses. Um, this is actually a picture depicting the optical laser goes through the diamond along with the x-ray beam, and then the two join and hit off the detector, which um, <coughs> helps magnify and make the product clearer. Another scientific use of the diamond is the microscope. It um, uses the diamond particles to see an object more clear and it is more efficient than a lot of microscopes, but it is very expensive, of course. And um, it will help the future generations to gain more collective knowledge and pass to their generations. The Hope Diamond it was discovered around the 1600s, but there's not a lot of history on it. It did not become known until around the French Revolution in 1792. That is when a lot of famous gems were stolen, and this gem was stolen for a long time, and they were not able to find it for a number of years. People were in a frenzy to find this diamond because it was so rare, because of the intense blue color, and the size, it was 45.52 carats, which is really big. And, um, and then, once it was found a number of years later, uh, it was sold in around 1910 for $160,000 about. And it has, uh, presently, it is worth more than $200 million. So it has gained its worth. Um, and because it's so expensive and worth so much, um, it was donated to the Smithsonian so it could be properly guarded. And it has only left four times since, so it will not be stolen again. And it has really affected a number of people's lives throughout the years. Okay, so the next thing we're going to be talking about is diamonds used in the jewelry industry. And also we're going to be talking about the development of diamonds over time. So we actually have a video. And with the video, the speaker has a very heavy French accent and they talk very fast, so you may miss some stuff, but as long as you get the big picture of it, you'll be fine. And he mostly talks about the company of Chanel. Gabrielle Chanel, long known for her costume jewelry featuring the pearls of the Orient and colorful gems, turns her attention to the most precious of stones, the diamond. 
Surrender pitilessly, still reading from the 1929 crisis, the diamond merchant single out Mademoiselle Chanel over the grand jewelers of the Place Vendôme to give diamond its true brilliance. So begins the most ephemeral, the most legendary of collections. Simply, Gabrielle Chanel simplifies jewelry settings, rendering the previous styles out of date. No longer is the stone itself supreme, but as in couture, line and pattern. She freely mounts and repurposes her diamonds as she once had dismantled the jewels given by the Duke of Westminster to create new ornaments. Resolutely, she makes fluidity a principle and liberty a virtue, removing clasps, lengthening necklaces, sending comets sparkling across shoulders and showering the décolletage with stars. I want, she said, jewels that slip between the fingers of a woman like a ribbon. Poetically, Gabrielle Chanel plucks the stars out of the Parisian sky. I wanted to shower women in constellations, the stars, the stars of all sizes to sparkle in the hair. Symbolically, she selects five themes for the Bijou de Diamant collection. Five, her lucky number, the key to her style, expressed in the magic of stars, the rays of the sun, the fluidity of ribbon, the insouciance of fringe, and the lightness of feathers. Secretly, Mademoiselle illuminates the darkest period of her childhood by recreating in diamonds, stars, crescent moons, suns, and crosses of Malta, which were laid out in the paving stones of the Abbey of Aubazine, upon which the young orphan tread every day on her way to Mass. Audaciously, Gabrielle Chanel does not exhibit her jewelry in her boutique on the Rue Cambon, but in her own home. At 29, Faubourg Saint Honoré. Refusing display cases and black velvet cushions, she prefers to show the jewels on simple wax mannequins, their hair styled and faces touched with makeup. Furiously, the male dominated world of the Place Vendôme demands that the jewels be disassembled after the exhibition. But as Mademoiselle said, are not the most beautiful things made to circulate. Finally, the 1932 collection will be Gabrielle Chanel's first and only high jewelry collection. But with it, she establishes a timeless code, creativity over ostentation, lightness over exaggeration. The innovations of the first couturier to venture into the Place Vendôme spread like wildfire, waking the world of fine jewelry from its slumber. Brilliantly, today's collections are enriched by those of yesterday, reinterpreting stars, fringes and ribbons, and invoking other elements of the universe of Mademoiselle, the camellia, the lion, the pearl. Insolently, today a diamond necklace worn over a t-shirt becomes an evidence setter, an elegance, an unspoken homage to one for whom beauty was not an obligation or a convention, but simply a way of being, an allure. Freely, these are the women who choose Chanel diamonds. Today their jewels are no longer trophies given by admirers, but symbols of liberty. A cluster of diamonds on the jacket, on the skin, or in the hair, adorning them with their brilliance, their strength, and their fire. Eternally, Chanel and the diamond. better insight on how diamonds were developed and how they started. And they were also used, they were used in rings, bracelets, necklaces, but the most common thing they were used in was engagement rings. The history of engagement rings started in 1215 when Pope Innocent III issued a waiting period before marriage. This period is known as the engagement period, which is when engagement rings come into play. And in 1477, Archduke Maximilian of Austria, he proposed to his wife, and she, I'm sorry. This was the first recorded presentation of an engagement ring with a diamond. And it also has effects on society from how um, it has to do with marriage and is involved in the process of engagements. This made diamond rings the standard for engagement rings. And there's different varieties of diamonds, like how big or small they are, and the quantity of the quality of them, and also the colors of them. So let me show you a chart. Okay, so this is the GIA Clarity Grading Scale chart, and GIA stands for Gemological Institute of America. <coughs> so the first part shows them and how they're internally flawless, and there are and no inclusions on them. And as you go into the right side, there's many imperfections on them. That's what those dots are. So. That shows that the quality is flawless, it has no inclusion, and then if there are more of them, that means it is less quality. This is the color grading scale used by GIA. The scale ranges from D to Z, and as you can see, colorless diamonds receive the higher grade, and as you go down the scale, the diamonds are more yellow in color, and this makes them less valuable. This is a numeric color scale for the diamonds. It ranges from 1 to 10, 1 to 2 being excellent, 3 to 4 being very good, 5 to 6 being good, 7 to 8 being fair, and 9 to 10 being poor. So, then we 
didn't come to colored diamonds. They, uh, colored diamonds come from the lower grade diamonds, which are the ones that are naturally yellowish or brown in color. They use these lower grade diamonds so that once the diamonds are colored, they can be more affordable to the general public. Diamonds are colored, or the lower grade diamonds are treated with irradiation and then intense heat. This process creates a permanent color for the diamonds. These colored diamonds come in white, gray, black, purple, pink, red, as well as orange, brown, yellow, olive, green, and the Hulk diamond is blue. Social impacts, well one obvious social impact is marriage proposal, as the picture right here. And marriage proposal, like the first thing that every girl wants is for a great story of how the guy proposed to her and gave her a beautiful diamond ring. And with, and with that comes people constantly wanting the diamond rings to make themselves feel better. Like some people are like, oh my gosh, I have to have my diamond ring in, or, in order to get through the day. Well, that leads to an obsession. People have been becoming obsessed with diamonds, and that is causing everything to be growing. And that constantly is like a cycle. It's feeding off of each other. And then diamonds overall, they help. They've shown development. They've gone through a variety of disciplines like medical fields, scientific uses, social impact, jewelry, and again with the obsession. But how is this relating to the future? Where where do you think diamonds are gonna go as time goes on? Are they gonna be completely around jewelry or are those different medical fields gonna find different ways to increase the uses of diamonds and maybe help save energy. Who knows what will be happening. Any questions? I want to hear more about that diamond patch. Diamond. Tell me again, it's when people have cancer, they... Um, when a tumor or where the cancer is, it's removed and um, they put the patch on there and... On the, or in? In. Mm -hmm. like okay. In. And the diamond, the diamond, um, particles that are on the patch uh, release, slowly release the chemotherapy drugs so that it doesn't go too fast and have bad effects on the person, but it still um, keeps the tumors away for the most part. You guys ever hear the movie Blood Diamond? No, but Miss Brady said something to me about it. Can I, guess, I can I take a guess as to why they called it Blood Diamond? Is it about the civil war? Diamonds were like one of the main causes of that. Yeah. Wasn't there a big lawsuit? Like they were bringing all these, I don't remember, some actors <coughs> or something in to testify about blood diamonds, getting it from someone? So there's some violence in the industry, right? Yeah, they caused a lot of violence, but right now they, Africa is actually at peace right now, but we don't know how long that will last until another group comes in and wants to take over. I know there are certain diamonds you get that are like supposed to be non-blood diamonds. Do you guys know much about that? Do you do any research on the whole process of getting a, a diamond that isn't embroiled in some kind of war? Well, I didn't come up a lot of research on that, but I saw in one area that a way to help say no to diamonds involved in blood, or blood diamonds, is by maybe when you go to the jeweler store, you'd be like, I only want diamonds that are not involved with blood diamonds. And so from that, from what I saw was that you can do it that way. Do you know there's a place in Arkansas, kind of close by, where you can mine diamonds? Really? Yeah, I mean, like, you go and pay a fee and... That's a What exactly is the carrot? Carrot? Mm -hmm. It's a measure of diamond and it relates to the uh, Why did you pick time? Well... To be honest, we didn't know what to do. And we all kind of had our own different ideas, but then, because we didn't really know what our paper was going to be about. We didn't, we really didn't have a clue on like the depth of it until like two or three weeks before it was actually due. And so, Caitlin, I believe, picked diamonds, and we all were like, okay, we don't have a group, so we'll, we all just decide on diamonds. So. 
will. So did you ever think about giving out samples? <laughs> I actually thought, because I like to cook, I actually thought about like making cookies and then like shaping them into diamonds. Yeah, I'm surprised you guys aren't wearing big blingy necklaces. That's if what I, I had did. One, I would have worn Tiaras, you know, I had. <laughs> Katie, I'm curious why you went to the back of the room to speak. What? Why did you go to the back of the room to speak? Um, because uh, just to make sure everyone can hear me and that they're paying attention while I'm moving around to keep people involved. What? I know, we did see lots of people like this in my head. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a plus. Yes. You guys mentioned inclusions, and when I went to look for a ring for my fiance months back, have you guys ever gotten a chance to maybe go there and see it yourself? Because it's it's cool. You can learn a little bit more about it. Don't don't put the microscopes up there. You can see it. Um, based off of the ring, the more valuable it is, the less inclusions it has. Almost ever there's none. But it's really cool if you look close enough. You see certain diamonds. They'll have like what almost seems to be these little like not bubbles, but just like these, dots. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. It'd be cool to see that in person because you guys have researched this. Yeah. Not actually kind of tangible evidence. To tell your parents you need to go shopping yeah. for diamonds. Yeah. yeah. Graduation. Yeah. Is that all the questions? Well, you guys, thank you so much. You did great job.